You're listening to Where We Are, a weekend conversation on faith, politics, family, and culture, hosted by me, Michael Ware, and my wife, Melissa. We bring our wide-ranging experiences in politics, ministry, and nonprofit life to bear as we discuss the issues of the day. On this week's episode, we're going to talk about expertise, the disappearance of moral knowledge, and a recent announcement from the CDC and the conversation that resulted from it. You're listening to where we are. This is where we are. We are the where is on Michael. I'm Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Sup? Not much, babe. It's uh, good to be with you. As always, we were able to get a little time away, kind of a, a work trip for me, but we were able to, we were, we were near a beach and it was above 50 degrees. And so uh, we, we were, we were, we were out there and it was, it was beautiful. I realized I was the only person in a bathing suit on that beach everybody else had like their long sleeve shirts on and their pants on and i'm like you know what i'm from buffalo this weather's great (laughs) yeah no we we were like yeah no it was it was was beautiful i've never i mean maybe a couple but it was cool to have the whole beach to really ourselves and there was, was there weren't a lot of people on the beach and then we found a ton of not dead, but living sand dollars, which I had to Google it while we were in the middle of picking them up. And I realized, wait, these little leggies on the on the underside of it are moving. That's the, that is the scientific term, <laughs> leggies. Little leggies. Um, they're, they're a sea urchin. And so we, we got like seven or eight of them that we brought home to the girls. And I, I figured out pretty quickly, I'm like, oh, these things have to die in order for us to bring them back for the girls. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. So I learned I learned new things. It looked while like Dunkirk out, out there. <laughs> it, was the, the, it was the Dunkirk <laughs> of the sand dollars. I mean, we were just. We were, <laughs> <laughs> I learned something new. Yeah, and so we went from the beach to uh, today. Uh, we we had like a game plan. I was going to take the girls to the park, mm-hmm. and we were going to kind of do that. And but what did I you woke say? up. I woke up and I finally said, "I okay, everybody. I have been craving an Italian sub or an Italian sandwich for weeks. The kind, N- not a euphemism. She's, she's a, a literal Italian sandwich. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, no. Keep going. We're gonna keep going. Uh, no, uh, I've I've been wanting an Italian sandwich where it's." mortadella and usually like mortadella soprasada salami that kind of combo but then with hot peppers um and like oil and like italian seasoning i've been really wanting that kind of sandwich for weeks now i've been talking about it we went to a sandwich shop two weeks ago they ran out of that sandwich so yeah, I, had that to get was a, crazy. I had to yeah. get a burger instead which the burger was amazing <laughs> don't get me wrong but The saga of me fixating on this Italian sandwich continued. So this morning, I was just like, you know what? No, we're going to go to D.C. We're going to go to Union Market. We're going to go to this place called Bar Bohem. I've had their Italian sandwich before. It's delicious. I went and had it. It was extra spicy today. It was so good. Anyways. When's the last time you fixated on this Italian is my is my question. Michael, we've already gone into the. We've already. This is. This should is, I not go back to that well? No, we should not. It was. It was like an hour and a half drive. Yes, it was. Uh, the girls got to see their aunt, though. Yes. We got to go to probably the best Italian wine store in the country, A La Terry. Yep. Um, and so it, it was a win. Plus, we like for for parents of like toddlers you know it's a win if you can just schedule a day that allows time to progress forward and that's what we had today yeah we did but that's been that's been our week yeah and i guess the only other thing from this week i want to mention is i just had the best most wonderful time in richmond 
was hosted by Four Richmond, Needles Eye, RCLI, a number of churches and ministries in the city of Richmond for an event in the morning with pastors, an event in the evening with the community. And uh, this was really kind of my the first book event for this book outside of the D.C. area. And I love D.C. I love folks in this city. So much of my uh, uh, time is spent, uh, you know, partnering with folks in this city. But, you know, caveat, caveat, caveat. But, my goodness, I was so glad to get outside of D.C. And it was so, so refreshing to be able to... Uh, uh, to be in Richmond for the day. And so shout out to the lovely folks in Richmond. Uh, anytime I can get back to Richmond, I'm going to take that opportunity because I, I, I just think it's it's a, a gem of a city with some wonderful churches and wonderful, wonderful leaders. And so, so yeah, so that was, that was my week. This coming week, I'm at Wheaton on Tuesday. Uh, I'm going to be in Miami. Those aren't public events, but I'm in Miami. Looking forward to that. And so, so yeah, travel coming up. But Melissa, maybe let's move to the topic for this week's episode. I sent you this New York Times article this week uh, covering the, the uh, potential CDC announcement. And one thing in particular caught my eye, but maybe before that, just as some context setting, want to just share very briefly about this idea around the disappearance of moral knowledge. And just as a synopsis for folks who aren't familiar with the idea, the disappearance of moral knowledge is a term that Dallas Willard developed. It basically refers to the idea that in the post-World War II period, gatekeepers of knowledge, principally Willard means academia, but also others, uh, other decision makers, uh, uh, decided that and acted as if religious and moral knowledge did not qualify as publicly available knowledge. It could not be uh, taught publicly. Uh, it could not uh, basically was not fit for public deliberation. And so here's Willard on the disappearance of moral knowledge. Uh, he wrote, What characterizes life in so-called Western societies today is the absence or presumed absence of knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong, virtue and vice, knowledge that might serve as a rational basis for moral decisions, for policy enactments, and for rational critique of established patterns of response to moral issues. Uh, elsewhere, he, he defined the disappearance of moral knowledge as the removal of the recognized values and principles of Christian traditional moral understanding from the domain of the knowledge that must be taught by the knowledge institutions of Western society. Instead, those values and principles were relocated into the domain of feelings and cultural traditions where they could not be taught by the acknowledged institutions of knowledge uh, as a body of knowledge. Uh, this is a really important concept. Uh, it, uh, my, the entire second chapter of The Spirit of Our Politics is focused on this. It, it is somewhat related to sort of scientism, or empiricism is another sort of term that folks use. There's some overlap there. They're not entirely the same same things. But uh, but it came to mind, Melissa, as I read this this New York Times article. The headline is CDC considers ending five day isolation period for COVID. Uh, Melissa, okay. Yeah, when I sent this to you, yeah, what did you think? Well, no, well, here's the base. Well, here's the basics of what's going on with the CDC. So, they're considering loosening its recommendations regarding how long people should isolate after testing positive for coronavirus. Um, so, under the proposed guidelines, Americans would no longer be advised to isolate for five days before returning to work or school. Instead. They might return to their routines if they've been fever-free for at least 24 hours without medication. 
um, that's the same standard applied to when you get like the, the flu, uh, like influenza type flu at, or um, RSV or other types of colds. Um, so they last changed their policy on isolation in late 2021. So now we're in 2024. So that's when they went from a period of isolation from 10 to five days. So about three years ago, they went from 10 days to five days, and now they're going to 24 hours after uh, your fever has ended. And again, this is just, con they're considering this. This isn't a done deal yet. And so, you know, I, I generally, I read that and I go, okay, it makes sense for a coronavirus to start being treated like other coronaviruses and the, uh, the sort of guidances that you generally hear from a doctor whenever you go in and you get, you know, the positive flu test back. So I thought, okay, from like a logical perspective, it makes sense to me based on my very, very limited medical knowledge of having been a sick person in my life <laughs> and going to a doctor. Um, you know, and now we have kids in preschool and it's like the same exact rule where if your kid goes home with a fever, they have to be 24 hours fever free in order for you to send them back to school. Like those, that's school policies as well. Most school policies, I would assume. So I read that, Michael, and my, my general thought is, hmm, how, how do they go from five days to 24 hours? And, and five days, of course, was, uh, it was originally 10 days yes. and then it was adjusted to five. And now they're talking about adjusting it to, to, to 24. But yeah, continue. I like that we have, had, we have had three more years since the last time they changed it. Because when it went from 10 to 5, it was in, my immediate response was, oh, this is just so everything can stop being closed all the time and the economy can get back on track. This is completely a political and economic decision. This does not feel like a public health decision. But the funny thing is, is that as we go into this New York Times article pretty much right away, you pointed out immediately some things going on here uh, that make it a bit interesting rather than just like a, oh, they, t you know, through a bunch of studies, they have found that actually you can go around 24 hours after the fever and you're no longer contagious. And therefore, public health would say that you need to start communicating this and maybe loosening the rules. So in this article... Um, the very first quote that they get from an expert, and I'm not going to say the expert's name. I'm just going to read the quote here from this person. That they asked but, them, but uh, say, sorry, Melissa, but yeah. say because the whole the, the the critical thing is uh, what's her role? What is her expertise? Um, she's senior director of the Special Pathogens Program at the New York City Health and Hospitals. So she says, end quote. From a long-term public health perspective, I think this sets really an unfortunate precedent. She urged the CDT, CDC to, end quote, seize this opportunity to truly change how we respond to deadly epidemics and pandemics and advocate for national guaranteed paid sick and family leave instead of caving into the easier option of eliminating the isolation period, end quote. So that's the very first quote of the article, and you immediately pointed out a, a big issue and it has to deal with this the disappearance of moral knowledge because on the on the surface of it you can go you know you and i we are you and i are very much pro paid family leave i mean uh, literally it's one of the longest standing issues that we've advocated on on this podcast uh, and on, on our this subsect. podcast but the, but the podcast subject uh and then our working professionally. government professionally. Yeah, and then yeah, professionally. Yeah. So <laughs> Michael and I are very pro paid family leave, so don't get us wrong here. But tell, start explaining to what you pointed out to me immediately here with this kind of quote from this person who, again, is the senior director of the Special Pathogens Program at New York City Health and Hospitals. She has no authority and no expertise to by which to give that opinion. She is not a public, she has no public policy background. Uh, but we we live in a cult, so in a in a in a culture of scientism, um, uh, medical and science those with medical and scientific expertise are presumed to have expertise generally, and so we have a culture in which uh, folks with scientific and medical expertise can speak into anything. So you have Carl Sagan, right? Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. uh, as an established uh, voice of authority on theological matters and the question of whether God exists. And uh, here you have, as the first quote uh, in a New York Times article, uh, a medical professional uh, uh, saying, uh, offering public policy uh, uh, guidance on on paid family leave, which uh, again I, I think paid family leave is a, uh, a a good thing, and even for public for for reasons of of public health, along with a whole range of other uh, other implications. But just so so interesting that the the, the medical expertise is leveraged. For a public policy recommendation in in such a such an explicit explicit way. Now you you contrast this, Melissa, uh, with both related to COVID and public health issues, but also a range of other issues: AI, uh, defense policy. I mean, a whole other range of issues where a moral and even theological insights are typically ignored and not counted at all or what ha- what happens often is we we come to them later after the decision is made after we see the consequences of our decision then we start asking these questions of like Oh, oh, God! Uh, you know, maybe we should have considered, you know, what this would do to society. <laughs> you know, like maybe, maybe mm-hmm. we should have considered. Uh, I, I mean, some of the conversation that that has been unfolding over the last, I mean, now years, but I've been reading a bunch of articles in just the last few weeks of like updated concerns about social media, and right, this is exactly it. So. Don't ask moral or ethical questions on the front end of introducing, say, s- cell phones uh, and iPads and, and whatever into the classroom. But now, 10 years after, <laughs> t- t- you know, you know a-, a decade plus into this experiment, now it's, oh, oh I wonder if we could have possibly... Um, avoided some of the consequences of, say, like uh, uh, mass depression and anxiety among teenagers and teenage girls in particular. But, you know, how, how could we have how could we have known technology was marching on? And, and so. So, yeah, so that's what I just found interesting. The scientific voice is is the first quote in the New York Times story speaking outside of their expertise into public policy um, uh, because of the, the regard that we have for, for science a, as almost synonymous with expertise. Uh, meanwhile, and at the same time, other kinds of knowledge are overlooked and precluded in in a whole range of public policy debates. So so yeah, right. that, I and found I mean, that super interesting. And I mean the whole pandemic and the polarization that the pandemic I mean polarization was already happening and the pandemic just seized you know a lot of people and it caused a lot of people to um gosh, what's the best way to put it? Um go to extremes in a lot of ways. Uh, because it was preying on a lot of like these these various quirks about information, information gathering, the government, how the government views public health, science and its prestige in society, this lack of moral knowledge. Um, but now, you know, we're four years into this pandemic because, you know, COVID is still around and for um plenty of people especially the elderly like you know we just had a surge in around you know over a thousand folks were still dying in like in december so 
you know, you, you have something that's still active in a lot of ways for, for a lot of people, not the majority, but a lot of people. And you have a lot of people holding on to memories of what the pandemic was like, of being communicated different things, different weeks by people, you know, who were supposed to be the experts um, and decisions feeling like they were being made for reasons other than what, you know, you were told that they were being made um, for and about. And, and so, even and even the the article sort of so this article is sort of these various experts opinion havers for instance really interesting quote from uh, from one doctor an infectious disease uh, an infectious diseases physician uh, saying uh, when you make a public health recommendation it's not supposed to be based on what people are already doing. And so, yeah, there's this, there's this question of sort of the, 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 the combination of hubris and like frivolity, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, that's involved in, in some of this. And, and I, I do think that just not enough not enough care has been given at multiple points over the last four, five years. Um, of, Of understanding that like people are paying attention. It's, it's not just sort of, what is what is the what is the current approach what is the announcement in the in the moment but thinking about think about how the approach in the current moment connects to what has been and what is to come <laughs> and and taking on the responsibility of I- explaining decisions in a coherent way um, and i think when you don't do that then distrust is like a a natural consequence yeah no the the trust the trust issue is is huge here and what the pandemic did when it comes to just trust in government institutions in general like in for example in the cdc um is it's a huge factor in in even in this you know this potential coming decision that you know they're weighing here of going from five days to 24 hours. And from a public health perspective, I, and then therefore from a, what stems from that, a policy perspective, whenever there is the next pandemic, and we're now being told that there, we're always under the threat of some sort of new form of a pandemic, which put honestly puts the fear in my heart. I do not want to go back to 2020 ever again. Um, is that the next time that this happens, especially if it happens within, you know, like the next 10 years, there's plenty of people who perhaps they don't remember the date, the first, you know, few weeks of what the pandemic felt like, or, you know, maybe they only got sick once and it wasn't that bad and they don't remember that kind of thing. But what people will remember is the distrust that was sort of seeded with like the CDC and with other public health officials when this happened. Um, and I think that that's going to be something that's consequential. Yeah. So, so yeah, I just thought this article was a really just a fascinating, a fa- fascinating uh, thing thing to discuss. So many interesting aspects of this article. How the CDC sort of, uh, and by the way, the CDC is it's really other experts commenting on a possible CDC decision, and so. If the CDC does make this decision, maybe we'll revisit this and see, like, okay, how do they actually roll it out? Mm-hmm. You, you know, yes. as opposed to a speculative article with a lot of sort of uh, with a lot of speculation from various experts, sort of critiquing this this potential new CDC rule. Um, but but I did think it, it helped uh, elucidate. A lot of the big questions we're thinking about right now, 
crisis of authority. Who, who counts as an expert? What is expertise? Uh, what is, what is truth? Um, same, same disease, essentially. Mm -hmm. Going from 10 days to 24 hours. I think the, the like public health explanation would be like, well, we've learned more or it's, you know, circumstances on the ground have changed. I still think that those kinds of explanations leave, leave something to, to be desired. So, um, so yeah, really, really interesting article would, would, would encourage folks to, to read it again. The headline at the New York times is CDC considers ending five day isolation period for COVID. And I'm willing to bet that the CDC, you know, floated this out there just to see the yes, kind of reaction. Exactly right. Like Melissa. the ones that we're having here on the podcast and, you know, like the, you know, whatever the news outlets pick up and whoever they grab for expertise, like the New York Times did in the New York Times, you can tell in this article they went for a certain kind of expert. Um, the ones who are definitely more 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 wanting the five days to stick and to not go away. Yeah. Um, yeah. They've definitely floated this out there to see what the reaction would be so that, you know, hopefully when if they do change whatever it is, that hopefully within their explanations they're going to provide maybe some answers to these kinds of questions that people are now asking because they're seeing that there could be a change. Yeah. Who knows, though? Uh Maybe just something to mention, Melissa. It just came to mind as we're at this, you know, kind of talking around these issues of authority. What's the duty of public officials? Um, what is the responsibility they have of communicating to the public? Uh, this came up in another way this week when the House Chair of the Intelligence Committee <laughs> puts out this cryptic tweet yes. saying that members of Congress were being briefed on an, a na an, an urgent national security threat and he called on the administration to make it public to, uh, to make it public to everyone. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, like, I mean, to me, this is like totally irresponsible, not without precedent, but but uh, irresponsible in that, you know, you're wondering, is is there an imminent terrorist attack? Yes. Is there a, a, a biological weapon that's on the loose? I mean, I had to travel that day. You know, you think, is it safe to travel? And so it really, you know, it really... Uh, it really was quite a quite a decision. Um, what it appears to be related to is a, a Russian a capacity building in terms of space based military capabilities and a concern that Russia's capabilities are, are are really advancing to the extent that the US and its allies could be like kept out of space uh, that that seems to be the um, uh, that 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 is the um, uh, the the general area of what what the uh, house house chair was referring to uh, Melissa what did you think is as this? As this played out, there were a number of explanations for why he did this. Um, it, again, was quite unusual. But yeah, Melissa, what did you think? I, I won't lie to you. I missed it the whole day, the, the news story, because I the kids and I had a bunch of stuff to do. And so I didn't read until the next morning when somebody um, texted me the update on, you know, more info on. And I thought, oh, this I kind of heard chatter about this. But let me go read what it is. I get, I don't know, a paragraph into the ba just the basics, and I go to myself, I go, oh, I wonder if he tweeted this out because I hadn't, the representative, it's Mike Turner. Yeah. I didn't yeah, look yeah, up, I'm like, I'm like, is he pro-Ukraine funding? Because Very he, pro. Is he, um, and <laughs> I, did, and I, did, and I yeah, didn't yeah. know that, and I go, because this just smells of somebody trying to get Ukraine funding through. 
that was my first reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of this, uh, one bit of speculation, and I think that sounds relatively uh, convincing. Uh, another explanation is uh, Republicans had just lost a... So this happened on Wednesday. Republicans had lost a special election on Tuesday. Right. Um, and so there was some speculation that he wanted to change the conversation from... You know this this defeat for Republicans in the House to you know speculation about a national security threat, but um, but yeah that that was that was one of the news drivers uh, of the last half of the week for sure. Anything else stick out to you from the news last week, or should we wrap this episode up? Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. There was. I feel like we should have. I feel like we should close with like a little jingle like, um, you know, Congress is still a mess. <laughs> Trump's still in court. Uh, you know, uh, like like we should we should We're come up with like a... We're still talking about Biden's age. Yeah, yeah. It's still talking about Biden's age. Um, uh, uh, yeah, we need to we need to close episodes with like a limerick that covers <laughs> the, the news we didn't discuss. Um <laughs> All right. Hey, we will be back with you next week for Where We Are. As always, thanks for listening. This has been Where We Are. Bye. I still wanna turn up, yeah, I still wanna turn up, all I want is to go again, but you ain't picking your phone up.